Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to IFFGD's uh, Idiopathic Gastroparesis Research Grant Winner Series titled Where Are They Now? This program was designed not only to acknowledge this year as being IFFGD's 30th anniversary, but to also give us a chance to reconnect with some of our past research grant winners. And today we have the extreme pleasure of speaking with Dr. Richard McCollum, who is our 2014 Idiopathic Gastroparesis Research Grant winner. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McCollum. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Good idea to uh, do a <laughs> little follow up. Absolutely, just to catch up and see where you are today. So, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe where you're currently located, and also your current research focus? Well, I'm originally from Brisbane, Australia. So, if you're watching the Olympic Games, um, Australian swimmers are hot right now. Uh, I'm also now at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso. I came here as chairman of medicine to start the medical school in 2009. And I continue as the director of uh, GI research and as the head of uh, the Center for Neurogastroenterology and Motility, a, a center here that's funded by the NIH. Um, so our focus continues to be on the field of gastrointestinal motility, uh, smooth muscle, neuronal, the brain, the gut, uh, the integration of how the GI tract works. Um, and we we continue to focus in that area. I think uh, lately we've been funded extensively by the NIH to work on gastroparesis. So gastroparesis has been a major focus the last um, seven or eight years. And more recently, um, microbiota. Everyone's working on microbiota of the gut. <laughs> Uh, so we're in that game, and we're trying to learn where the microbiota might play a role in the cause of so-called idiopathic gastroparesis and may explain some of the symptoms of gastroparesis. Yes, how exciting. How exciting to be in research right now. I mean, yeah. uh, just like you said, it's so many uh, research studies going on with the microbiota, but hopefully soon we will understand the association with that in other GI conditions like gastroparesis. So as we kind of go into um, the interview here, um, how did winning the IFFGD idiopathic gastroparesis grant really help further your research in that area in 2014? Well, we were very interested in those days and to some degree still are um, on the role of neurostimulation, neurostimulation. This was a research project where uh, patients would have a, a certain point, a Chinese um, nausea point and actually a motility point called the P6 point up here and another point just below their patella on their, below their knee. And we would stimulate that. And based on research that we have performed, we felt we could improve nausea and, and improve the symptoms of fullness, bloating, pressure, um, and discomfort. And so this was a double blind study where on one day, uh, these pressure points would be activated by a band around the wrist or around the upper um, leg to stimulate those points and see if on those days it was different than days when the band would be there, but there would be no active stimulation. There wouldn't be any mm -hmm. activation of those points. The patient would, would not know which day it is. I wouldn't know which day it is. And they would eat a meal and then we would uh, have them feel, fill out their symptom uh, status for the next uh, two or three hours. And so we, we felt that it was time, time to look at neurostimulation of the gut. It's still a very topical area, but that's really what led us to do this study in idiopathic patients. These are not diabetics where we believe we know why their stomach is slow and why they have other symptoms. These are idiopathic where we're not sure about the sensitivity of the stomach to being distended or touched 
uh, whether there is a heightened sensitivity to nausea. We felt this would be a, a way to cover a lot of bases uh, in a non-invasive way, which yeah. can have some implications for therapy at home. These, these bands could be used as outpatients. This was a one-day study, one-day placebo, one-day stimulation. Wow. You know, just that kind of research study, it definitely touches on anything that is very, the troublesome symptoms that can be debilitating for many of the patients who do suffer from gastroparesis. So just understanding some ways that we can maybe help uh, manage some of these things is really cool. And did any publication maybe come out of this research that was funded with the grant? Well, it was interesting. Um, so, you know, acupuncture is a very, um, well, interesting approach, alternative medicine approach, and patients often get acupuncture. Uh, that was another stimulus for us to see whether there's something being uh, activated when you do stimulate the nerve endings. What we found is that on the placebo day, as well as the electrical stimulation day, patients improved. Wow. But it was not significantly different. So what we concluded is actually on the day that they didn't get stimulation, they were breathing. We, we emphasized breathing and on a certain uh, stimulus for every fifth breath, we would uh, activate this um, electrical stimulation. But on the placebo day, all they would do is continue to breathe. So this was sort of a breathing, relaxation, distraction um, research protocol plus, in retrospect, plus stimulation. And what we learned is that probably not news, but we didn't really appreciate as much, is the breathing, distracting, relaxing. That's a very important technique, underestimated technique. And although the electrical stimulation added maybe a touch more, it was not significant. So we learned that probably treating many conditions in the maturity world, yeah. uh, distraction, meditation, relaxation, diaphragmatic breathing, that all plays a very important role. So we, we ended up getting a, a, a result that we wouldn't have predicted initially, but not surprising given what we know about that particular approach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like you said, definitely not surprising in a way, especially with all of the research that is coming out about some of these other approaches to help cope and manage with some of the symptoms of GI conditions. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you touched at the beginning of this, that of some of the research studies that you guys have, in, have going on in your lab today, but can you tell us just a little bit more in detail, maybe what these topics are that you're currently working on? Well, I, I think in the field of gastroparesis, which is one that we focus on with the NIH, I think there's uh, there's two major directions. Uh, the pyloric sphincter, the pylorus at the end of the stomach where the food has to eventually exit and enter the small bowel has become a very hot topic. It's been somewhat neglected. And we now know that a big part of gastroparesis is actually a non-compliant, uh, non-opening uh, resistant pylorus. And so we're doing special studies to find out how resistant is your individual pylorus. So we do a study called endoflip, where a small balloon is inflated in the pylorus and we measure your pressure or your resistance. And then if it's abnormal, we move ahead to what's called pyloroplasty. It's either done endoscopically or traditionally by surgery called a, a pyloromyotomy or a, a pyloroplasty. And so that's been a major improvement in symptoms. And more importantly, when you biopsy, when you get the tissue from the pylorus, at surgery particularly, mm -hmm. what we learn is that this pylorus has a lot of pathology. It has a depleted interstitial cells of cahal, which determine the electrical rhythm, and it has a lot of fibrosis. So this was a worthy target. We got to it late, but it's opening the door for much improvement in gastroparesis. The second topic 
microbiota, we're trying to understand why 80% of idiopathic gastroparesis, we have no etiology. We blame it on, gee, you had a viral infection, food poisoning, gastroenteritis happened, your nerves were damaged, but we don't find a virus, we don't find any antibodies, we don't find inclusion bodies in the biopsies. So we wonder whether there are microbiota in the upper gut, duodenum in particular, maybe the stomach, which could inhabit for a while and impair gastric motility. We know idiopathic can resolve. It resolves in many cases within a year or two. So could this be a transient period where abnormal flora evolve, abnormal genera, and then they slowly resolve? And so whether how positive it is, the question has to be answered by someone. What's the role yeah. of microbiota in gastroparesis? The other part of it is just hanging, just having food, being stagnant. These microbiota can flourish, and many of the symptoms of bloating, fullness, pressure, and discomfort, could that be the result of dysbiosis and normal genera uh, multiplying in the setting of stagnation? So we're looking at symptoms and we're looking at gastric emptying. So yes. I, I, the study has to be done. I can't guarantee it's positive, but it's a question everyone's asking. Yeah, and, you know, you can't guarantee that it'll be positive, but, you know, it'll also at least lead us into a direction of understanding some type of area and maybe where we might want to turn a corner and look and investigate in the future. Um, and okay. are there certain ways that maybe patients can be involved in some of these studies? Um, is there anything that you might want patients to know in terms of how to get involved and the importance of being involved in these studies that you have going on today? Well, uh, two directions. One is we're doing them here at Texas Tech El Paso, but we hope that in the next six months, the NIH, which is um, funding this research, uh, there's six centers, um, Massachusetts um, uh, General Hospital, Brad Quo, uh, Henry Parkman at Temple. Um, we have um, Louisville and um, Tom Abel. Uh, we have Wake Forest, Winston-Salem, Ken Cook. Um, and so any of those centers, unfortunately, not so much on the West Coast, but they will be open and patients can can access those centers. And so yes. that's the good news. They may have to travel a little distance, but, you know, the data will be out also within a year or two, hopefully some preliminary data, and that may stimulate you know, other centers in the country, not funded by the NIH, but just good medical centers, good universities to add that to their repertoire. It just requires during endoscopy, taking a brush that we use every day for cytology and rub the mucosa of the stomach and duodenum, rub the cells onto the brush, which is then put in special media. Those cells uh, come off the brush and are then analyzed to see what genera, what what bacteria are housed in the duodenum and small bowel and stomach. We know it's different from the colon. Most of the studies are in the colon. Fecal yeah. transplant and all that stuff, that's a very hot area, but that's sort of being exhausted. We're in the upper gut, duodenum and stomach, and those bacteria are totally different from the colon. They have their own intrinsic milieu, and we want to see whether that milieu changes. Yes, we are so excited just to hear, especially with the preliminary data you say coming out in another year, hopefully, but we're really excited just to kind of learn a little bit more about some of these topics that we haven't really understood um, here in the past. So hopefully this is at least leading us to a light at the end of the tunnel to better understand patients living with idiopathic gastroparesis. So, out of all of the research studies that you've either led or been involved in, what would you consider maybe being your most successful study? And I mean, all research is important research because we learned something from it, but what would you consider being your most successful? Well, we just presented uh, a paper at the DDW, albeit virtual, wasn't quite as exciting, but we, we presented <laughs> it. And the double blind study, first in the world, 
and I suspect the only one which will ever be done, it's a very, very demanding study, where we treated refractory patients who could not respond to medical therapy for gastroparesis, and we gave them um, a surgery, and they had a polaroplasty, we cut the polaris, and we put in a device called a electrical stimulator, a gastric electrical stimulator in their stomach, which stimulates um, the, the, the lining and the smooth muscle and the nerves, but mainly goes by afferent nerves to the brain. It's a powerful anti-emetic. It blocks nausea and vomiting. And then the pyloroplasty opens up the pylorus and the food empties and the stomach becomes normal, gastric empty. So we did that for the first three months. We did not turn on the stimulator. So this is a double bind placebo study, cut the pylorus, put in a stimulator, but don't turn it on for three months and look at symptoms and gastric emptying three months later. What's the difference? What does this stimulator add that just doing a pyloroplasty could achieve? And what we found was, yes, patients were improved compared to baseline in both groups compared to their individual baselines. We had, I think, uh, uh, 16 patients in each group. But when comparing them together, were, who were they better at three months? The group who had electrical stimulation and the polaroplasty were significantly better in nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting. Less ER visits, minimal to none. Less nausea and vomiting at home with backup medication and better quality of life. Gastric emptying was helped, obviously, because the polaroplasty was done. And patients who had fluoroplasty were happy, but they were happier with gastric electrical stimulation and we're now following them up six months later. Everyone got turned on at three months. Everyone got turned on and we're going to follow them another six months and see at the end of six months, how do we look at them? So I think that's a very uh, innovative, demanding, Absolutely. clinically demanding, a lot of hours put in trying to do this study. But it, it, for the first time, it shows there is a role for gastric electrical stimulation, uh, so-called enterotherapy. There is a role in nausea and vomiting. That's what we thought it did. It's a great antiemetic. But you need to open up the end of the stomach called the pylorus to empty the food and improve symptoms. So that, that showed that the best therapy today, if you are refractory, it's a polaroplasty plus electrical stimulation. So that, that, that's a very, I think, important study for people in practice. You know, we always ask, what have we done for our colleagues in practice? You can publish yeah. a lot of stuff and make out you're doing very well. But have we changed patient care? Have we made a difference? And this study makes a difference. It tells you the best treatment right now for patients who are not responding to medical therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a crucial point for many patients living with gastroparesis. I mean, really, patients are looking for something to help manage um, this such a debilitating condition um, that affects really over five, approximately five million people in the United States. So it's extremely important, and we appreciate all of the time and effort that you and your lab and other people around have put in to really investigate this condition and just really help patients, like you said, not only just publishing papers, but also finding ways that we can really help the patient community living with this. So what do you, I mean, your passion just exudes here on the conversation that we're having, but what do you really enjoy about being a researcher? Well, I think it's building a team, creating, uh, having a vision of collaborative research. What else can we do? Can we stimulate faculty members in other departments? Stimulate and grow your team. I've got a great right-hand team member, Dr. Irene Soroshiak, who worked on all these studies with me. We stimulate young GI fellows who may go into research. Uh, we collaborate and reach out to other departments, surgeons, pathology, psychiatrists, and uh, nuclear medicine, MRI, brain imaging. Uh, it's a vision of developing a team, creating excitement, uh, publishing new research, and 
you know, driving forward, advancing the field, yes. having the commitment to improve patient care. Patient care is the bottom line. We're not just doing this to pad our CV. We're, we're trying to improve and discover something to help patients. Yes, and you guys are doing a great job. We are so appreciative of all of the hard work. And like you said, it definitely does take a collaborative effort across the board to really help advance the field, especially whenever there's a condition that we just can't understand. We don't understand, but that doesn't mean that we won't. So, so excited to hear this um, from you. But, you know, one last question to kind of wrap things up here, and I think it's really important. Um, what do you see as being some of the gap needs, which you kind of touched on, but what do you still see as being some of the gap needs in the area of research of idiopathic gastroparesis? And how do you foresee maybe your lab or other labs fulfilling this gap need? I think it's an area that we, we've discussed um, often on our telephone calls with the NIH, and that is the brain-gut connection. There's no question that particularly in idiopathic gastroparesis, there is an emotional, sometimes post-traumatic stress state. Mm -hmm. We've seen patients who have been physically or sexually abused, depression. Understanding, I think, the connection of how the brain and the gut interrelate even more, doing more sophisticated MRI studies of the brain, maybe more sophisticated uh, questioning and knowledge areas of your pain sensitivity. Why do some people sense bloating and distension and fullness? Others, it's just a daily normal symptom we live with every day. Others are in my office saying, doctor, I can't take it anymore. What's the difference in way the way we're perceived, the way we respond to symptoms, the brain-gut connection, the psychological state of the patient and their background, Maybe your microbiota contributes to your psychological state. So I think that's going to be an important area to understand why some patients are functioning, others are in our office and are not functioning. Yes, yes. And you know, if we continue to ask those questions and continue to look for the answers, we will further the, the area of research in this field. And what an exciting time, like I said at the beginning here, to be in research and to be a researcher. And, you know, we just really appreciate, like I've said, just all of your hard work and your dedication truly to the patients um, that are living with gastroparesis. So, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has tuned in to IFFGD's Idiopathic Gastroparesis Research Grant Winner Series. Where are they now? Where today we've had the extreme pleasure, really, thank you so much, um, of catching up with Dr. Richard McCullum um, here today, who is our 2014 winner. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Let me thank the IFFGD as well. Uh, their, their research, their willingness to reach out and stimulate research help people like me and my team, and they have made a huge difference in the research world and the lives of many patients. So let me make sure they are given due credit. Thank you so much for that. And thank you again for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for a great interview. I enjoyed it very much.